Hola, Dingo! Back when I was just a young anthropology graduate student, I went to the island of New Guinea and found myself in the midst of an anthropological fantasy. My friends there, who I had now known for many years, decided to have a big dance. And to be honest, like this dance just completely confused me. People were moving here and there, and I didn't really understand what was going on, but it seemed really, really significant. I just had to find the right story or the right myth that explains what was going on. There had to be some really deep meaning of what was happening in front of me. They started dancing in the evening, and they were still dancing at 1 a.m. when I went to bed. And when I woke up, I could still hear them dancing. And when I went down to see what was going on, you could tell that something very special had gone on. As an anthropologist, I really wondered, is there some deeper meaning? So I thought, maybe it has something to do with birds. They're wearing these bird of paradise plumes on their heads, and not far from there, over to the west, we find this story. There is a fable told by a mountain people living in the ancient highlands of New Guinea about a race between a snake and a bird. The bird won, and from that time, all men, like birds, must die. And so I went and found all the elders and asked them. Nobody seemed to have a good answer. Nobody had a special story or some great myth about it. They did tell me about bowerbirds and their dances and how similar they are. And maybe there was something there. But to be honest, I felt like I kind of led them into that. I came up empty. It really didn't seem to tie into any sacred beliefs or mythology. About a year later, they had another dance, and this time, I joined in. And while it might look like really simple that you're just kind of bouncing up and down, it's actually quite hard, and you can see here, if you just zoom in, uh, you can see that my tail feather is not quite doing the right thing. <laughs> Mine's kind of floppy over here. And the women at this time are, are singing, Tabala wustayo, tidaka minmayo, which roughly means white man stop dancing and make some tea. Eventually, I got it, and when I got it, I started realizing just how much fun this could be. And I started to get a sense of the camaraderie and the joy that was being created. I finally thought, maybe I should take them at their word for what they say this is all about. They say this is about amamasim, which simply means to make happy. One way to take this is that this isn't a religious thing. So we have this idea of religion, that it is the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal god or gods. But that strikes me as a very biased and boxed in definition. Many religions do not focus on belief, don't really care or think about whether or not someone believes, and might not even have a word for belief. For some, the point of religious practice is to move past belief altogether. And in Buddhism, uh, all views are wrong views. When you get in touch with uh, reality, uh, you no longer have views, you have uh, wisdom. You have a direct encounter with reality. So one option would be to take a whole lot of what we think of as religion and just keep it outside of religion because, hey, religion is about belief in the supernatural. But anthropologists prefer a different approach. We tend to think that religion is not what you think, or rather, religion is not just what you think or what you believe. And focusing on belief leaves out much of what makes religion and life most interesting. Belief, which we make such a fuss about today, is only a very recent religious enthusiasm. It surfaced only in the West in about the 17th century. The word belief itself originally meant to love. Here, Armstrong is building from the work of Wilfred Cantwell Smith. This book is, as Ronald says, an interesting but difficult study, but it is pretty impressive. Paging through chapter six, you see that he tries to break down every case of the word believe he can find over the past several hundred years. And what he finds is that the modern English word leaf, which means dear or beloved, goes back to old English, leaf or lif. And then there's this parallel word lufu, which becomes love. 
So luf means dear or beloved, and in verb form like galifan means to hold dear or to love. So what happened? Well, Copernicus challenged the notion of humans being the center of the world. Galileo gave us the evidence. Europeans were traveling all over the world discovering that people had all kinds of different religious beliefs. And then Darwin vastly expanded our notion of human history, which ultimately challenges the notion of an Adam and an Eve in the Garden of Eden and that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Before all of this, you could actually think of God as a fact of the universe. And the word I believe simply meant that given the reality of God as a fact of the universe, I align my life accordingly, pledging love and loyalty. But after this revolution, God becomes a question, and I believe becomes I believe that God exists. And then religion, as it became known in the West, became all about belief, and it was put in its little box to take its place among the other boxes of society. Religion is not science, it's not art, it's not politics, and as Europeans traveled the world, they looked at religion through this boxed-in lens. This is why Kwame Anthony Appiah makes this startling claim, There is no such thing as religion. Instead, he claims that Europeans basically create religion. When they came to his homeland of the Ashanti in Ghana, they saw a soul disc or a grand festival or people making offerings to the ancestors, and they said, ah, that's religion. My point is that when you look into the lives of those people, you also find that every time they do anything, they're conscious of the ancestors. This is not a world in which the separation between religion and science has occurred. And because these Europeans defined religion in terms of their own faith as belief in one God, they called themselves monotheist. And as they looked at other faiths, they would box them in based on their own biases and preconceptions. And so the remarkable complexity of something like Hinduism becomes nothing more than polytheism, belief in many gods. And all of this vibrance of life that we see in New Guinea is put in a box and labeled animism. And even worse, early anthropologists would actually line these things up as a progression towards science. And that animism, polytheism, even monotheism were mistakes on the road toward pure rationality. The problem here is that we make these labels and we think that we get it, but in fact, we've completely missed it. Think about what you see here, for example. There are many layers to what you see happening right here. On one layer, this is a young Buddhist monk who's getting ready to go give blessings in exchange for food and donations. On another level, he is just one of billions of souls trapped in the wheel of life and death, the wheel of samsara. And he's trying to find his way out of it, to nirvana, to enlightenment. And on another, he's an orphan. He lost his parents five years ago. And he became a monk to earn merit for them, to send them spiritual gifts in the afterlife, wherever they may be. So that maybe they'll have a chance at a better life on their next rebirth. The point here is for most people in the world, Beliefs are not just intellectual propositions up for debate. Religion is deeply woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. These are not merely intellectual propositions. This is how people will confront and negotiate their mortality, navigate the inevitable tragedies of life, build and maintain a sense of morality for a functioning society, how they anchor their values, and how they seek experiences of peace, joy, and communion. It's in this sense that David Foster Wallace can make the startling claim that we started this class with. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. He's not trying to erase atheism or claim that atheists are not real. He means that all of us, believer and non-believer, seek out and are guided by ultimate meanings, values, and purposes. If I were the kind of person who could believe, now would be a good time to believe. 
but I'm not that kind of person. We all face the great cosmic questions. We all know we are going to die. Every human is a little bit sad all the time because you know you're going to die. But that knowledge is what gives life meaning. We make ideas about how the world works. We orient ourselves towards certain values. And we have daily rituals to help us live in accord with those values. And while not all of us believe or worship within an established or traditional religion, we cannot help but weave our own fabric of life. The goal of anthropology is to reach out and actually feel that fabric, to feel the many fabrics of life that humans have spun. Feel the texture of life in other worlds, not just to label it and put it in a box.